Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Greg, so much for that really um, generous introduction. And um, many thanks to the Rachel Carson Center for having me um, and for the wonderful opportunity to share a few ideas about my in-progress book. Um, I would also like to first thank the primary funder of the research that made this book and what I'm going to be talking about today possible in the first place, and that's the European Research Council, who supported this through the Biosec project led by Professor Rosaline Duffy at the University of Sheffield. Um, and finally, um, I also want to thank my fellow comrades at Landhouse um, for being here. Um, it's already been a really rewarding and exciting experience, and it's really, um, I'm just so grateful to get to share uh, this time and space with all of you at Hermannsdorf. So with that said, I also want to thank Carl and the wonderful team of people at Hermannsdorf for putting up with a bunch of odd academics. Uh, wandering around looking at pigs with very limited German language skills. Um, waking up every day at 4.30 to sweep the stalls of the pigs and feed them has been a very enriching experience for us all, both in mind and spirit. So, okay, let's, uh, let's get to that. Yeah, that's a joke, yeah. Um, so, my book focuses on illegal tr and illicit trades in cactus and succulent plants. And the broad argument that I want to share some ideas about today is that political ecology has not sufficiently grappled with desire. This demands, I think, examining multi-species relations in um, a psychoanalytic and more than human register. So I became interested in illicit succulent trades um, because I wanted to understand first why these trades exist in the first place, um, what were the consequences of such trades, and third, why were individuals motivated to engage with them in the first place? So it's this latter why question that led me down the sort of winding, dark path towards desire. Uh, but to begin, I think I should say something about also these plants. Um, this was important for me to become familiar with these plants that move passionate collectors to engage in illegal or illicit behavior. So within a matter of months of this project, I had already a sizable collection of cacti of my own mostly gifts offered to me by other collectors after interviews or touring their greenhouses. And so without even meaning or wanting to, I too became a collector, if a slightly more law-abiding one. Um, so among internationally traded plants for ornamental collection, cactus and succulent plants are some of the most heavily threatened. Collection pressures can be so great for some rare species that they have almost or already been driven to extinction in the wild. A variety of species of succulents, such as the Dudleya genus in North America, which I write about over the course of three chapters in my book, um, and the Conophytum family and Lithops genus in, from Southern Africa, places like South Africa and Namibia, currently face intense illegal collecting pressure, and the latter face pressing extinction concerns right now. Um, across the cactus family, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, or the IUCN, assessed in 2015 that 31% of all 1,500 or so species of, cactus, um, of cacti are threatened with extinction, with 47% impacted by harvesting for horticulture or private ornamental collections. Cacti are therefore considered one of the most threatened taxa of species on the planet, inclusive of both animals and plants. So people might be said to love cactus and succulents to death. So I became especially interested in what this love is really all about and what it signifies. My entrance into this study was through the world of passionate plant collectors, primarily in the UK, Europe, and the United States. I chose to focus my study on succulent collecting cultures in the global north for a few key reasons. While there is widespread attention to illegal wildlife trades that move, say, from African countries to South and East Asian countries, what's known as the African-Asian nexus, Countries like the US, the UK, and even Germany are actually some of the world's largest consumers of illegal wildlife trade products. Um, so this general inattention to Western countries as key sites of illegal wildlife trade consumption is underlain by uneven power dynamics, racism, and colonial legacies uh, that all too often focus on perceived environmental injustices elsewhere, but not at home. Western newspapers write scathing, investigative reports about the use of wildlife products in, say, traditional Chinese medicine, while the consumption of the very same products in other guises is, is, goes largely unremarked upon back in home. The trade in succulent plants is no different. 
But in writing a multi-species ethnography of these traits, I also wanted to spend time thinking seriously with the plants themselves. There's been something of what we can call a vegetal turn in recent years in, across a variety of academic fields, so-called plant or vegetal geographies, critical plant studies, even vegetal philosophy, have become subdisciplinary fields in their own right as part of a wider environmental humanities or environmental, I should say, plant humanities movement. Part of what I find so generative in this literature is a deep and thoughtful engagement with widening the project of more than human thinking beyond the simply human-animal dyad. Plants demand we think about their capacities differently than the animal world. So I was drawn to, uh, towards the ways these plants are not simply enacted upon as inert and material commodities um, in their trade, but also how their liveliness mediates their commodification. So I'd like to just take a moment to also briefly introduce some of the key vegetal actors you might say I spent time learning and thinking with over the past four years that are centered at various times in this book. And so I think actually the first one I'll start with is right here. I don't know if I need to hold it up for the camera. This guy, for those, those watching. Um, this is, um, uh, what, well, I should say, most people probably know this as the Christmas cactus or Thanksgiving cactus. I don't know in German what it would be called. Um, uh, it's an interesting plant. Um, how many people maybe have one at home? Yeah. Yeah. Um, depending on how we think about success in the sort of ecological world, one could say this is one of the most successful plants on the planet. Uh, it adorns windowsills and slowly dies on radiators around the world. Um, it is not a species, per se. It's a group of hybrid mixings of around eight or nine species in the, Schlumber in the, in, excuse me, the Schlumbergera genus. Um, and in particular, Dutch uh, cultivators of plants are very, very good and have spent a couple of hundred years um, developing some truly beautiful plants that we all have come to know and love as the Christmas cactus or Thanksgiving cactus. Um, and in terms of its abundance, it's widely successful. Um, the actual genus is restricted to a few isolated pockets of the Mata Atlantica or Atlantic Forest of southeastern Brazil um, in the heavily fragmented areas between Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo. For instance, one species, Schlumbergera orchisana, um, is, if not already extinct in the wild, likely will be in the next 20 years, um, likely um, due to the combination of fragmentation and habitat loss, as well as very passionate collectors. This is actually an epiphytic plant that grows in the corners of trees. Um, and it's also actually a cactus, if, albeit a very unusual one. I find Schlumbergera an extremely interesting plant to think with in these ways. Um, many, if not most, of the species of the genus likely will no longer exist in the wild, so to speak, or in their habitats within the coming decades, quite possibly, and yet it lives on in this multitude of forms around the world. Another you see here is Mammillaria bertholdii. This is also a cactus, even if it doesn't look like one maybe to some of us. Um, it has these unusual feathery pectinate leaves, as they're known in botanical circles. Um, it's from only a restricted few subpopulations found in a remote area of the deserts of Oaxaca on the traditional indigenous territories of the Mexica. Um, when the plant was described in the mid-2010s, um, by the time it was formally described in the scientific literature, it was already being traded um, across Europe. So at a time in which it was only discovered in the scientific literature, passionate collectors, in fact, had already found and discovered the species, so to speak, but were waiting for scientists to catch up with them so that they could then go on to sell it. Just to give you a sense of the state, this is what it actually looks like growing in habitat, which is actually quite different than what it looks like growing in cultivation. It's about the size of a euro coin. It's quite tiny. You can see, for instance, from this quote from Thomas Linzen in the, in the, um, in the Mammillaria Journal, this is a German cactus journal, he writes, undoubtedly, we are the biggest threat, collectors, to Mammillaria bertholdii at the site. It is the urge, the craving to possess everything that is new and still has the appearance of the unusual. As far as I know, Mammillaria bertholdii should be classified as endangered in habitat. I quite understand the interest of cactus lovers for this new taxon, 
but an assault on its habitat, it would not survive. It would be destroyed even before properly being known to the world. And so these are some of the dynamics I'm very interested in my project. Just to give you a couple nice more pictures of plants, this is Dudley Farinosa and what it looks like growing on the coastal cliffs between anywhere from Santa Barbara in California up into the middle parts of Oregon. Uh, it's abundant where found, but only grows in an incredibly niche ecotone between sort of the coastal beaches and the tops of the cliff plateaus. Um, it enjoys being sprayed with sea salt, but it can't, it can't survive having its root be roots being soaked in wet, so it only grows on cliffs. So in cultivation, it's quite difficult because it easily will rot. This is another picture of Dudley Farinosa being sold for $4,000 on the international online plant market. Um, and so I've written about some of these dynamics already um, to look at the sort of various forms of lives these plants um, sort of um, enact in various circulations around the world and as well as their commodification. And the last little plant I'll, I'll, I'll feature, and this is a plant I write about more extensively in a piece coming out in Environmental Humanities in July, is um, a plant known as Erosidoa marielene. You see it here growing on the top of a single mountain where it was only discovered about 10 years ago. It's an incredibly unusual plant of this genus. It can grow several meters tall. Um, it only is known to grow on one mountain in Brazil known as Serra Escura, or the Dark Mountain, um, uh, which um, a few years ago received mining acquisition rights um, and will soon be sort of blown up into nothingness. Interestingly, the mining corporation has a sustainability plan and is slowly removing these plants from the mountain with the plan that eventually they could be planted elsewhere. Of course, the fact that the plant grows nowhere else in the world suggests that maybe there are some problems with that plant. So to come back to desire, because I mentioned desire, I faced a bit of a problem in taking seriously these plants as well. Because I said I wanted to give attention to the vegetalness of these plants on the one hand, while on the other I was drawn to why people who are so passionate about these plants and their care would engage in activities that would seem to hasten their extinction. The task then, as I saw it, was to find a way to bring the practice of multi-species ethnography and matters of more than human care into conversation with psychoanalytic geographies and psychoanalytic, uh, psychoanalysis writ large. Um, there is not much love lost between these uh, fields of scholarship, however. By and large, what we find instead is an impasse, though there are some recent shifts in this trend. Um, but I want to dwell here for a moment at this impasse. So consider, if Anna Singh writes that human nature is an interspecies relationship, we might consider why more than human scholarship tends to neglect our unconscious selves, which compose a key space through which humans navigate the world. Donna Haraway writes that we are in a knot of species co-shaping one another in layers of reciprocating complexity all the way down. Like Donna Haraway, the psychoanalytist Jacques Lacan also liked thinking with knots and shows how the unconscious can be understood topologically through knots that can join the real, the imaginary, the symbolic, and chains of signifiers. As geographer Steve Pyle aptly writes in one of the few articles to begin some meaningful conversations between these fields, quote, the effective and emotional intensities of human and non-human relationships must be seen as fundamental to how and why psychical structures take the forms that they do. So I just want to say a few words now about what I mean about desire, and we could talk about this all day, but I'm going to keep it short. So in Lacanian terms, desire is more than another way of, saying, of naming what we want. Desire is foundationally about lack, the impossible quest to be unified with what the desiring subject supposes is lacking that might deliver a sense of true um, satisfaction. So to paraphrase Lacan, desire is the desire to desire, the aim for an impossible satisfaction through the unification with what the subject supposes has been fundamentally lost. It's a shattering, even ontological loss that brings the subject into being as a desiring subject. So I, became a des I become a desiring subject by constantly, unconsciously, and repetitively aiming for what I suppose this imagined other, or big other in Lacanian thought, desires as my own desire. But as a fantasy, this imagined lack can never be truly satisfied. The other, in other words, makes desire possible, as, but and a, a fantasy of satisfaction ensures we remain in the throes of this desire. So to ground how this matters in the commodification of the non-human world, the work of Todd McGowan shows us how capitalism powerfully exploits and adheres to the desiring subject's desire 
by introducing commodities that would appear to be the one thing that might bring us some real satisfaction, but always ultimately fail to do so. This failure of the commodity to deliver satisfaction is in itself, however, a form of pleasure in Lacanian thinking. It enables the repetition of failure to be reproduced through the introduction of yet more commodities that might be the thing, but of course never ultimately are. This is what keeps us going out and buying and buying and buying. So I hope we can start to see how it becomes a bit clearer how these ideas surrounding desire start to matter in trying to understand and theorize about the worlds of cactus and succulent collectors. Collectors, might, collectors collect because there's always another thing, another plant that they imagine might be the one. This isn't all collections do, of course. The collecting of a living thing enables the collector to exert efforts of care, which can be rewarded in moments of self-affirmation when that caring pays off, for instance, in coaxing a challenging cactus into flower. But within the context of these plants, in caring, the collector may also do great harm to the species, especially if they engage in the removal of wild plants from their habitats. So these acts of caring and concern for plants are important to understand um, plant collecting cultures. But only approaching these acts as care sidesteps what lies beyond care as in the act of collection. So here I turn to work from cultural and psychological studies of collecting um, to understand what motivates forms of collecting, a practice with a rich tradition in Euro-Western cultures. Much of this literature tends to how the objects of collection serve as receptacles through which the social and psychic meanings are adhered and affixed. So, for instance, by which the subject can produce their own image in the face of death, permitting the self in some form to go on through the material objects they leave behind. We can say in some, collecting is ultimately about the collector rather than the collection. And so it's perhaps no... Um, Coincidence, Freud's famous antiquities collection, he began two months after his father's death. But what collecting scholarship does not address is the liveliness of plants in collection and how that liveliness vitally matters to understanding collector-cactus relations. So just as a collection um, may deaden an object in a certain respect, removing it from its utilitarian life as, say, a spoon or a thimble or a sword and transform it into a symbolic object Objects in collection are also given a new life through the people who instill them with a sense of their own living self. So even if collections represent the death of the living object in a certain respect, in the world of cactus collectors, collections enable the self to live on through them, rested out of time in a desire for the eternal. When, the collector, when a cactus collector tells me that they've wept at the death of a decades-old plant, it's not the plant alone they weep for, but memories of past collectors and even past selves, who have also previously cared for these plants and imbued them with meaning. But as one collector said to me, you have to understand these aren't just stamps or coins on a shelf, they are living things. Cacti are not immortal like stamps or coins, but neither do they live and die in uh, human or animal temporalities. Cacti can produce seeds that can be shared and raised, um, they can be gouged with a simple penknife, only to have five or ten new pups emerge, as they're called, from the wound weeks later. They can be grafted from any fellow member of the cactus family, one on top of another. Many of you have probably bought a cactus that was actually two different species tied together. They can be chopped in half and begun anew. An arm or segment can be removed, creating a clone of a plant while the mother plant lives on. So in this way, the self of the collector can be made to live on through the lives of their vegetal others. So excerpts, I think, from an interview with a cactus collector may help to further ground these ideas. Um, this was from a, this, these are snippets from a conversation with a retired coal miner, an avid cactus collector in a small town in northern England. Um, and I apologize that I'm not going to attempt the accent. Um, so I said, why do you think you like cacti in so, so much in particular? He said, I've been told it's the shape. Now the other thing I like, as I've gotten older, is the plant that survives in a hostile environment. That's tough looking. So there is a bit of, dare I say, there's a bit of a macho-ness in it. It's a tough looking plant, but then it flowers. And it's got such beautiful flowers, but how that cactus lives in an awful condition. Now there's also an attachment, he went on, that me granny got me into it. So what's my favorite thing? Echinopsis. It's a genus of cactus. Why? 
because they are the plants I got with me, Granny. When they flower, this ugly thing that we got from the desert were just wondrous to me, that could live in a desert and then have this beautiful flower scented to attract moths. He then went on to explain how in his 20s, he didn't have time to care for his plants anymore while he was a miner and decided to sell them all off, except for the three original cherished plants of the Echinopsis genus that he got from his grandmother. But when a man came to buy his plants, he only wanted those three, being the biggest and most beautiful. The collector pleaded with the man not to buy them, but the man offered him 80 to 100 pounds each for each one. This was in the, in the 70s, and this was a sum of money he couldn't refuse at the time, something he said he continues to regret to this day, and he sold him. It's worth noting that he practically only collects Echinopsis cacti now. Our conversation then took us to the, his greenhouse. Maybe I see myself in them a bit, you know, the collector said, describing the many flowers these plants would produce in a matter of months. He chuckled, acknowledging attention in his own performance of masculinity, his desire to be seen as tough and macho, compare, composed against this moment in which these tough-looking plants suddenly bloom in wondrous flower, something hidden, secret, something that must be coaxed from the plant through meaningful, attentive forms of care, something that took place in the privacy of his greenhouse between him and his plants. So where I became fascinated by plant collecting cultures, I was equally fascinated that people who clearly had such meaningful relations with these plants could do work in the world that harms them. I don't wanna to get too lost in international trade regulations because they're quite boring, but what makes a cactus trade legal or illegal predominantly relates to the international trade convention known as CITES, some people might be familiar with, or the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. What is most relevant here to note is that all cacti are listed on either CITES Appendix 2 or 1. Appendix 1 means there's absolutely no international trade permitted at all except for certain scientific exemptions, while Appendix 2 means trade can occur but requires permits and approvals that, um, from relevant CITES management authorities. Important as well to note is that unlike most plants listed on CITES, all cactus seed from Mexico are also listed on CITES. So this means that even the trade in seed is internationally regulated for Mexican cacti, a country with some of the highest biodiversity of cacti in the world. What further complicates this story is that at least historically, Mexico has not been forthcoming with permits for plants or seeds. There are a variety of reasons for this, but one is that permitting some legal trades in species to exist can enable greater capacity for illegal trades to occur along or within those legally permitted ones. It takes a very careful eye and skilled person to be able to recognize the hundreds of different species of Mexican cacti to say nothing of distinguishing their seeds, which basically just look like tiny poppy seeds. So by not giving any permits, the regulation of these trades, especially for border control ag agents, is simplified. Um, it's important to also clarify a little bit here the space between the legal and illegal and the licit and illicit. So there's just a basic schematic up here that shows that there are these relations that exist between the space of, the, of legal, which is effectively you know, uh, the space of law and politics, versus the, the licit or illicit, which is the space of social norms and acceptability. Okay? And there's flows that occur between them. So what separates the licit and illicit is a matter of social rather than legal concern. Um, broadly speaking, within the cactus and succulent collector community, a sizable portion of the hobby does not find it terribly objectionable, if at all, um, to collect and distribute seeds from the wild. Um, this past year, I conducted an online survey with some collaborators, predominantly in the US, in the UK, and Europe, on a variety of topics. Oh, the, the survey respondents were cactus and succulent collectors in the Europe, the UK, and um, uh, the US. Um, so we haven't published this work yet, but what we found were 42% um, of collectors that we surveyed, of, of around 450, found it either very or somewhat acceptable to collect wild cactus and succulent seed, while approximately the same percentage found it unacceptable. But not only do many within the, in the hobby not find this practice objectionable, many advocate for illegal seed collection and trade as a social good, as important conservation work. As one survey respondent wrote, when a new species has been discovered, there will always be a demand for this species and it will find its way 
into its way, it, um, its, it will find its illegal way into collections. The checks, I write a lot about the checks in my book, are very good in rapidly multiplying new species, thereby strongly diminishing the pressure on that species in its natural habitat. Somehow, he writes, there should be found a legal format for this because although illegal, it is for the benefit of the species in nature. So within the world of avid succulent collectors, we can say it remains a normatively licit activity to collect wild seeds while also acknowledging it sometimes as an illegal act. So while our survey also suggested that many might unknowingly be breaking international trade laws due to lack of unfamiliarity, many do so with great intentionality. So unsurprisingly, many conservationists see this a bit differently. So I was interviewing a Brazilian botanist and he explained that where he used to feel that it was completely unacceptable to take anything, plants or seed from habitat, his um, opinion about this had begun to change, especially as he noticed ongoing habitat destruction and degradation. He told me, quote, it means at least the plants exist somewhere, he explained. If you think about how many seeds many of these plants produce each year, it is staggering, and most won't germinate and go anywhere. So I don't mind if they collectors take them. I really don't think it matters. To other conservationists, this is a very flawed and even dangerous perspective, even dangerous to share. In another interview, a Mexican cactus expert and conservationist insisted that the ban on trade in Mexican seeds was meant to protect the species in their long-term flourishing. She argued, maybe taking a few seeds or a hundred seeds won't matter too much to some populations, but how many collectors are doing it? If hundreds are doing it each year, that could really impact these populations, she argued. So, although these two cactus collectors agreed that many cacti produce abundant amounts of seed each year, their interpretation of the significance of these low germination rates of cacti led them to very different conclusions. Widespread dissemination of the seeds, even illegally on the one hand, um, or alternatively a strict preservationist mindset on the other. Others leverage another argument in framing the collection of seeds or plants as illicit, and this is based on the idea of ecological sovereignty. So in line with this thinking, Essentially, they argue that, especially for foreign tourists, say from Europe and the United States, it's ethically wrong for people to be taking what they see as Peruvian, um, Peruvian or Brazilian or Mexican heritage. This perspective was best summarized by a Mexican bureaucrat from Canabio. Um, when I asked him what he, why he thought many European cactus collectors didn't seem to find it problematic to take Mexican cacti in their seeds, um, he laughed, responding, they've been stealing from us since 1492. Why would now be any different? So captured in this, here is this shadow that colonialism continues to cast over the cactus and succulent collecting hobby as a historically Euro-Western tradition, one closely tied to notions of discovery, exploration, and the hunt in foreign lands for exotic plants. Collectors still talk about going on cacto explorations, for instance. So there is something captured in this sense of a feeling of an anti-colonial resistance that emerges from this idea of claiming an ecological sovereignty. But against such efforts, um, others, like um, environmental scholar Mick Smith, would critique such moves as yet again reproducing ultimately harmful human nature distinctions um, predicated on ownership and domination tied to sovereignty of the state. I'm very sympathetic to Smith's arguments against ecological sovereignty, but at the same time, uh, it remains important to confront these colonial harms embedded within the challenges to species conservation and what the work of caring actually entails. The legacies of colonialism that haunt botanical exploration and description, just as they haunt conservation and collection and illegal trade, remain largely to be reckoned with. Returning to collecting scholar Susan Pierce, she writes, collecting is not only an inscription on the world, it is also an imposition on the world. So I've only touched on a few ideas from the book today, um, but to conclude, I think to fully conceptualize both desire and the illicit, in the collecting of living beings, we have to also attend to these kinds of impositions in their imperial and colonial histories in their ways of relating. It's through these sorts of interdisciplinary conversations in my project, I'm aiming to work um, with desire as a meaningful analytic for political ecology and more than human registers. Um, I would contend that recognizing and confronting desire in what it indexes may prove just as important to the survival of these species as attention to the political economic consequences of what Western fantasies of nature as something to dominate and possess have already wrought. Thank you very much.